You think that you had some crazy parties back in college? Well, unless if your parties directly resulted in the deaths of almost 100 people, a yearly penance, and the scalping of clerics, you didn't party as hard as these Oxford boys did back in 1355. College riot enthusiast Professor Jelly here, and today we dive into the St. Scholastica riot page on this episode of Weird Wikipedia. So the St. Scholastica riot happened on St. Scholastica Day, but it had been brewing for quite some time. Because just like today, there's always a lot of give and take between the university and the non-academic town that the university is in. The thing about all you students is, you think that you know everything just because you can read and you've got all your fingers and toes and teeth. And while today, obviously Oxford has a very high reputation, at the time, they seemingly had more in common with football hooligans than they did with scientists. In fact, there was so much conflict between town and gown that almost half of the murders in Oxford between between 1297 and 1322 were by students. And the town was doing their part too, because after the death of a woman in 1209, the townies end up lynching two students, which actually led to a group of scholars leaving Oxford and founding their own school, Cambridge. <laughs> yes, that is actually the founding story of Cambridge. And when they weren't fighting townspeople, they were fighting themselves. With one incident in 1314 between the two main factions of the university, the Northern men and the Southern men, 39 students were killed. If you thought that hazing for frats now is bad, imagine cold-blooded murder being on the docket. It should also be noted that as England was a Catholic nation at the time, before Henry had something to say about that, the church wielded incredible social and monetary power over the peasants that lived in the town, and Oxford was directly linked with the church with all of its theological scholars. So students were essentially everything short of above the law when it came to town folk, and the town folk knew it, and they hated them for it. So all this was simmering in the background when on February 10th, 1355, St. Scholastica's Day, a group of students went to celebrate at the local pub, the Swindlestock Tavern. And if you've ever watched Goodwill Hunting, this plays out exactly like a medieval version of how about them apple scene. <laughs> so upon entering the establishment, the group ordered some wine. However, they felt that the wine that they had been served was unsatisfactory and that they requested a different drink. However, the bartender ignored their request. Later, the historian Anthony Wood noted that several snappish words passed between the men until the bartender served some stubborn and saucy language right back. Woo! 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 And then in response to such speech, a student stood up, a clergyman no less, and threw his drink in the bartender's face. And then, depending on whose side that you listen to, either threw the cup at him or like beat him over the head with it. <laughs> Not the greatest day of piety for the Catholic Church. <laughs> this resulted in the roadhouse worthy brawl which eventually spilled out into the street, which then led to both sides ringing church bells to summon reinforcements and eventually devolving into a riot. Fighting in the streets continued until nightfall until both sides returned to their respective dwellings. Now at this point, no one had been seriously injured and this is probably where the riot should have naturally ended. And to ensure that it did, the leaders of the school in town got together and made a proclamation that we should all, you know, not bear arms and kind of, you know, take a chill pill. Meanwhile, the town bailiffs are going around telling people to arm themselves and going into the country to pay people to come and beat the students up. Which led to about 80 people going to St. Giles Church where some of the students were located, whooping up on them and at least murdering one student in the church. But things really went goblin mode when about 2,000 people from the countryside showed up with a black banner chanting, Havoc! Havoc! Smite fast! Give good knocks! Or however you pronounce that in broken bootleg Middle English. But one thing is for sure, they gave some good knocks because they started knocking down the doors of the halls that the students had barricaded themselves in, drinking and eating all their food, stealing anything worth taking, and you know, killing any scholar within swinging distance. The next morning saw even more bloodshed when the mob broke into another 14 halls and started the old cleric scalping, which I'm just gonna say, is plain mean. A scalp is all that a cleric has, and you're gonna take that away from him? Don't talk to me, don't talk to me. As the third day winded down, however, it was a bit of the old SpongeBob meme. As nearly all of the scholars had fled Oxford, the streets, rivers, and cesspits were littered with the bodies of students and townspeople, and most of the town had been burnt down. And nearly all of the student halls had been destroyed, except for those of Merton College, whose students were noted for being very quiet 
and whose hall was made of stone, so it's kind of harder to burn down. Once the smoke cleared, it was determined that there was probably around 90 people who had actually died, probably around 30 townspeople, and probably somewhere around 60 students. And after the party was over, it seemed that both groups knew that there was going to be some consequences for this because the leadership of the town and the university surrendered themselves over to the king. After four days of deliberation, the king came out with the following decision, which consequenced one group significantly more than the other. On one hand, the scholars would be pardoned and have their positions reinstated, and on the other hand, the town would be fined 500 marks, the mayor and bailiffs were sent to prison, and nearly all religious services were banned in the town. Later in the year, there was also a royal charter given to the university, which gave it preferential legal abilities to the town. The university was also able to tax bread and drinks sold in the town. The officials of the town were required to swear undying allegiance to the university, and once the religious services ban was lifted, an annual penance was required where the mayor would have to walk barefoot to a mandatory mass honoring the fallen scholars, where he would have to pay a one penny fine to the university for each student that was killed. A completely fair and even-handed judgment, your majesty. So at least did these judgments stop the conflict between town and gown? I mean, it kinda, you know, it never was as bad again, I mean, you know, but you don't go like cold turkey from, you know, scalping clerics to, you know, solving things with a friendly chess match. I mean, it was like the last time it got close to being like a civil war, you know? <laughs> it's a pretty low bar, but I mean, like it never happened again, so. The annual penance for the town was followed until 1825, when the incumbent mayor, Isaac Grubb, legal name, refused to take part. And they were like, it's been 500 years, whatever. Little, little side note on Isaac Grubb. So he got like really popular for like standing up to the university like the town comes first and everybody loved him for it until they found out that he was selling his bread cheaper to the university than he was to the town and then they rioted and tried to lynch him <laughs> look what you call the breakdown of civilization we call tuesday before lunch in oxford <laughs> And finally, in 1955, on the 600th anniversary of the event, the town and the university had a ceremony where they said, let's let bygones be bygones. I think that the town should pay for past aggressions. Well, I think that the university has received preferential legal treatment in the past. <laughs> and so with all this being said, whose fault was it? Or, well, whose fault was it more? It may be easy to say that obviously it was the townspeople due to the whole, you know, cleric scalping. But some historians have noted that the riot can be interpreted as a result of years of preferential treatment given to the college over the people who actually lived in the town. In a somewhat similar situation to what happened in the French Revolution. Like as I said, the whole lynching of students that led to the founding of Cambridge thing, the people did that because they knew if the students were handed over to the university, almost certainly nothing would happen. And frankly, they were right. I mean, just look at the judgment that the king handed out after the riot. I don't know if there was many townspeople who would say that was a fair judgment. So, was the riot a populist uprising against rich and privileged men who could do whatever they want with no legal consequences as they were guarded by the authorities in the church? Or was it a place of higher learning being pillaged by a bunch of knuckle-dragging meatheads? Due to the extremely biased reporting of the event, we may never truly know the full unbiased story. comes down to was some dodgy plonk being served at the pub, and some of the most dodgiest food ever created was the dill burrito, a Dilbert themed burrito which I made a video about, which you can watch right here. <laughs>